Woody's been a, uh, a very great client, probably close to 30 years, and uh, I think you've told you the story, but uh, one of the funniest part of all the story to me is, you know, we kind of lost track of each other, and uh, I was chairman of the Roswell Design Review Board some time ago, and, and I wish I had a picture of his face when he walked in the room, and I was sitting up there, you know, dressed up nice, and gavel and calling the meeting to order and uh, he was bringing a, a nice project and uh, I think we helped him uh, navigate you know the, the city ordinances and, and, and have a great successful project but anyway I, I'm real pleased to be here uh, got 50 something people on a beautiful day like this inside to hear somebody talk about trees uh, you know it's nice to be here appreciate your invitation if I'm loud now, I'll talk. be good with that. If you want me to use a mic, I will. Everybody hearing okay? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, uh, so I thought about what I wanted to say because I, you know, we, we talked about doing this last week. And, you know, I, for me to talk to people, I, I'm not a PowerPoint guy. I don't want to show you slides. I want to tell a story. And I started thinking about, you know, what I wanted to tell a story about. And, you know, I, I got the inspiration to really tell you the trees tell stories. So that's what my presentation is. And I'm going to give you an anecdotal story. Um, I have a lot of them, but this is my favorite story. I'll give you a little bit of background about myself first, though. So obviously, I'm Kevin Caldwell, and I'm Caldwell Tree Care in Roswell. We've been in business about 31 years, well, 31 years this month. I was uh, in the first class of arborists that were certified in the Southeast in 1992. Um, I started working outside 50 years ago as a young man cutting grass in uh, East Cobb. My journey put me through college at UGA as a political science undergraduate and a pilot candidate in the United States Air Force. However, I found myself leaving that trajectory and ended up working at uh, some of you guys probably have heard of True Green. I went to work for True Green coming out of school and then later went to work for a larger tree company called Arbor Guard uh, out of Decatur. <clears throat> later I had the good fortune um, at that time at Arbor Guard of getting to know uh, the most world's famous arborist, uh, Dr. Alan Chaga. Um, I attended a week long seminar called A New Tree Biology, and that's where um, I learned from Shiger that trees could tell stories when you examine them forensically in particular. We went into the woods, dug up trees, tree roots, cut logs, cut cross sections of logs, etc. We'd look at different species and put fine slices of the trees under electron microscopes and examine the cellular structure. We even tested them for their stored carbohydrates and starches and um, kind of interesting. Well, a week of this getting dirty outside, going inside to a rudimentary lab at Appalachian State, aging trees, aging wounds, and taking a deep dive into the tree biology really made me curious as a young man and wanted to become a great arborist. That curiosity kept me attending multiple a new tree biology seminars that Dr. Chigo put on, which were week-long seminars at Appalachian State, and very expensive, and you know, really deep dives into um, arboriculture. Each time, the content got better, and I understood more. Everything that had Chigo, everything that Chigo, he signed, he signed, touch trees. So we go to a seminar, so. He did the seminar, and he was pretty proud of him. He'd have him sign, and he would sign, touch trees. So he meant it. And when I go look at specific tree or trees, it's the first thing I do. Now, we, we didn't get a chance to walk around and have nice shoes on today, but that's the first thing I do is I, I sort of just start touching the tree. I touch the bark. I talk, touch the trunk. I measure the tree trunk. I look into the tree canopy. I use my feet when I'm walking around and feel the soil. And I attempt to activate all my senses around the tree and really get a feel for its story. 
It's life. It's land around it. It's age. It's hardships. And it's contribution to the surroundings. I think I've told one of you ladies here, I already kind of aged your trees. Um, just looking at them today. Um, now, I want to tell you my favorite tree story that I use <clears throat> as an arborist to help answer questions about a very sensitive tree situation and why the tree was dying. One day in the spring of 2013, I was contacted by an arborist in Destin to investigate why a large magnolia was dying on a prominent development. I quoted my thesis for a day down there and back and was quickly hired as my references were pretty stellar. Uh, not to mention I had just finished my chairmanship of the Tree Care Industry Association, so I was pretty well known actually. So I packed up my tools like soil probes, pruners, hand saws, binoculars, tape measures, diameter tapes, chemicals to measure the starch contents in the trees, and everything else I could carry in a large toolbox. So, a toolbox with my bag on the plane for the day. <laughs> I arrived at the Destin Airport and was picked up by the most prominent female arborist on the island, along with her assistant, and driven to the site. Upon arrival, I noted quite a bit of construction activity going on around the development. The ladies that brought me there worked with me over the, walked me over to the tree where I was there to analyze it was an enormous magnolia with a diameter well over 65 inches in diameter, so that would be more than, you know, what three people could put their arms around. I had never measured or seen a magnolia that large. And in my studies, according to the research, that magnolia only lived 80 to 120 years, and this just didn't seem to measure within that confine. So, and, and they weren't indigenous to the island of death. So with my first look, I saw where the top of the tree was cut out to allow for some zip lines to go right through it. It looked like a prior sand. <laughs> like six zip lines cut right through this thing that was hollowed out. So this magnificent centerpiece of development with the buildings flanking it had, you know, there's multiple zip lines going through it. Further, it had dual circular staircases going around it. And uh, going around the trunk within a few feet. And the uphill side of the tree, um, you know, it's up here, there's a couple stories down, so the stairs went down you know, to the lower side. There's a tremendous amount of holes being dug for the footers, for the steps, and the staircase, and the associated deck. All of this site work and conditions were absolutely overwhelming, and even to a novice, one might conclude up front that this tree was literally being killed at that moment. However, I knew I needed to prove forensically why this tree was significantly dying back and why it was declining. So I started taking soil samples, measuring tree diameter, measuring twig growth, comparing twig growth to the last 10, 15 years of twig growth, measuring starch with my potassium iodide that I've taken from one of my old summer Chicago seminars. It actually measure, measures the energy of the tree. Um, and so on and so on. I took copious notes and then went to a long lunch with these two nice ladies that had me down. And I was just baffled at the enormity of this tree and what appeared to be a slow decline in death. It just didn't seem right that even despite all the recent activities, this tree would be declining in the way it was. You see, the decline appeared to be progressive based on a radically slow twig growth over the last 15 years. So here comes 2 o'clock, and suddenly a crowd starts congregating around me. <laughs> Lawyers for the preservation group that was paying me. Lawyers for the defense of the developer who stood to lose the rights to continue to develop this project if he killed this tree. There was press there and lots of other interested people from both sides, and I'm still not clear why this tree has been dying over a period of time. I then looked up on the tree trunk and saw a large, fresh cut. 
fresh branch cut. So I borrowed a ladder, crawled up on it to have a look. I noted quite a few growth increments, and I observed radically different sizes within the growth increments. So I took my pen and I walked through them and counted them. And noticed that there was a significantly compressed areas within the increments. I made several marks and <clears throat> noted there were three specific compressed areas of the increments. So I addressed the crowd and asked, what happened 15 years ago? The arborist that brought me there looked up on her phone, and her phone said, that was hurricane such and such. There's a gentleman sitting on this little wall right adjacent to me, and he said, he's sitting on the wall three feet away, he said, yeah, that, after that hurricane, the parking lot washed out, and we had to build this top layer of the wall and backfill this area. Interesting. I said, so what happened 25 years ago? Again, referencing the compressed tree growth increments. The artist again said, that was Hurricane Charlie. And that occurred, and the old fell sitting on the wall next to it. And, and, and I put that other layer on the wall right there, the one in the middle, because the parking lot washed out and I had to backfill it. Continue on, I asked, what happened 35 years ago? You want to guess what the arbor said? <laughs> the parking lot washed out, and we had to backfill the parking lot and fix the parking lot, and an old man sitting on the wall said, yeah, that's when I built that first layer of the wall. So I'm sitting there thinking, okay. So I said, what happened 185 years ago? And that was based on an extrapolation that I made based on the tree diameter and what I knew to be of the approximate age of the tree. Someone said, well, that's when Mr. Destin discovered this island. And they said, there was a legend that he planted a tree here that he used to tie his boat to, and that he had brought this tree planted here. So, I hope I've painted the story right. So I didn't know this story. The tree told the story. And I, by this time, I had almost as many people, maybe more. And I just thought I was being hired as a consultant just to go out and just you know, tell the developer to kill the tree, and they were going to write me a check for a few thousand dollars, and they were going to fire this guy off this billion dollar development, and he was all nervous. And I'm standing in front of a crowd like this, except I'm not prepared to what I'm going to say. This is all discovered in the last, you know, 30 minutes of my um, analysis. I'm playing, I've got to get you playing in an hour and a half. So, I said, this is how I see this. Because, historically speaking, magnolias were not indigenous to the island, it's likely that Mr. Destin planted this tree based on my estimated age of the tree. Secondly, I surmised, based on my observations, and indicated by the growth increments and the current site conditions, that the developer was just finishing the job, killing the tree, that the preservation group had started 35 years ago when they had created the parking lot within three feet of the tree and the consequential walls in three layers would continue to kill nearly half the root system of the tree. So anecdotally, I used my forensic teachings to tell the story of the island of Destin and how this magnificent tree had revealed its history. Both parties had worried about the fate of this tree and ended up realizing it was both of them at fault and not just one of them. Their outcome, or this outcome, allowed for the arborist to come up with a removal plan and she memorialized the tree with a large carving um, 
believe it was made into a carving of dolphins by a famous artist. And it was treated and, and uh, displayed as the new masterpiece in the area. So that's an example of how trees tell stories. And that just happens to be one of my favorite stories about trees. And um, if you guys have any questions about that or any other things, I'll be happy to answer. But I just thought I might entertain you with that because it turned out the outcome was you know, we had these parties that were in this huge conflict. And it, it resolved the conflict, and, and, and honestly, the tree told the story, and it couldn't lie. I do have one question. Yes, ma'am. Is it my understanding that uh, when you do excavation or anything around the tree, you should go no more than one foot per year covering the dirt or anything? You know, I don't know that that is the standard. You know, it has any kind of excavation or activity under the drip line of a tree. Um, the rule of thumb that a lot of municipalities work with is anytime you disrupt more than 20% of the concentric circle around the drip line, <coughs> anytime you go past 30%, you, you're killing the tree. Yes. So those are, those are pretty standard protocols that, that most of the arborists use in city codes. I will tell you though that um, that's just sort of standard. It's not necessarily um, you, you don't necessarily just say I just hurt a tree for 30 percent and, and it's going to be fine. You, you do want to engage probably someone that you know is a really good practitioner arborist to help you walk through that. <coughs> yes ma'am. Um, compaction is a very serious thing for an old tree. And we, you know, we've got our beautiful oak. Yes. And we're going to have people walking a lot. Should we be aerating around? Which oak are you referring to? The, the, the white, the water oak. The water oak at Sea Hall? Yeah. So that tree needs a little more than just that. That tree needs a. I know. Well, I did a drive by with Woody this morning. Um, that tree is in decline. And, you know, water oaks kind of grow fast and die fast. And, you know, Water oaks were killed, you know, ha most of a family down in Virginia Highlands. And they fall through a lot of homes in Brookwood Hills. They they have a very um, quick growth habit, and, and, and they're in the red oak family. Red oaks don't compartmentalize and keep wounds out very easily. So that tree may or may not be a tree you want to spend a lot of time worrying about the compact compaction. Now, uh, aeration root invigoration, there's a lot of different ways to, to do that. The tree has no mulch under it, if I remember correctly. That, that's part of your issue, too. Yeah, we, we are putting some under it. So, but that tree probably, um, I don't want to commercialize, I'm not, you know, <laughs> asking for any work, but you need to have someone that knows what they're they, doing. They, they, to, they came out this past week, Diane, um, uh, Scott and Chris, did I guess it was a city? and did a thorough study of the tree, and they're going to be talking about tabling it, and then going out three times the width, I mean the diameter of the tree, and that's what needs to be, according to what Scott was telling us, um, what needs to be done, because with all that grass around, the grass is soaking up that water that the tree needs, and the nutrients that the tree reads, it's kind of a short, so 